All I require is to sit in the sun, read my book, alone. I will leave you now to your book. That is all I ask. Books, young man, books, thousands of them. If time wasn't so important, I'd show you something. My library, thousands of books. Hello, hi. My name is Peter Hong. I'm a、uh, co-host of the Trek Book Club on Twitter.、Uh, today, the first episode of the Trek Book Club podcast. For today, we'll be reviewing "A Pocket Full of Lies" by Kirsten Bayer. And to help me, we have two special guests. We have Bree and we have Kimberly. And I liked each of them to talk a little bit about their Star Trek、uh, origin story as well as their Star Trek book origin story. Bree, thank you for coming. Give a, a overview of your、uh, origin story. Yeah, thank you, Peter, for having me. This is going to be so much fun. So I grew up with Star Trek in my family. My mother and father were Trekkies, and、uh, when TNG started to air, they were very excited. And TNG was one of my approved programs that I was allowed to watch. So I grew up watching TNG with my parents, and we were living in the Chicagoland, Milwaukee area at the time. So we had different conventions to go to. All the time, it was so much fun. So I was able to go to those conventions as a kid, and、uh, my love for Star Trek just continued on into adulthood. I didn't discover the books until later, and、uh, it was all by chance. I was at my used bookstore,、uh, Bookman's, over in Phoenix, and I realized how many Star Trek novels there were, and I really gravitated towards the Voyager relaunch books, which are the books that take place after Endgame, the last episode of Voyager, and、uh, I. Just I ate them up, and then every time Kirsten、uh, Byer would like release another book, I was there for it. So really excited to discuss this book with you and、uh, discuss it with Kimberly. Okay, great. Okay, thank you very much, much Bree. I real I remember on the book club that you mentioned that you really liked this book. So I'm、um, glad you were able to join us then.、Mm -hmm. Okay, Kimberly, can you talk a little bit about your background in Star Trek? Yeah, sure. Thanks. I、um, my dad likes Star Trek, so that's probably the way that I was first introduced to it. I started watching The Next Generation when I was a kid and just absolutely loved it.、Um, not so many middle school girls were into Star Trek at the time, so it was a relatively、uh, lonely fandom for me. But it was still something that I stuck with for a long time, and I didn't end up. I'm not a completist. I haven't、um, watched every single episode. You know, I watched DS9 and Voyager and、um, a lot of the new shows, but not everything. But TNG had always been my favorite. And then I was a little bit late to Voyager, but that very quickly, and probably in like the last five to ten years, became my second favorite Star Trek show. And as far as the books, I started reading the novels when they were back in the numbered. Novel days、um, in middle school, and really enjoyed those for a while, and started, you know, writing my own stories with fan fiction at the time before I knew fan fiction was a thing.、Uh, but once I was a little bit older, I realized I just didn't want the standalone stories. I really liked following the characters over time and seeing development, and so I stopped reading the books for a long time. And rediscovered them、um, as an adult when I realized that they had started some continuity after Nemesis, and thought, "Well, this is really wonderful. The Destiny trilogy was just incredible.、Um, I really liked what they did with the Next Generation characters in particular." And when I found the Voyager novels, probably in twenty twenty, I didn't get them one at a time like Bree did, but I just tore my way through them and. In the exact amount of time that I needed to be there when To Lose the Earth came out, I think Kristen Meyer is an incredible author, and she really made me love these characters you know, more than I ever had、um, when I was younger.、Um, but she just gives them so much depth. I'm excited to talk about this book. Great, great, thank you. Yeah, I'm glad this book and the the last few books in the Voyager arc seem to be very popular. Especially among the Voyager fans, with the the full circle, right? Okay, thank you. Okay, so we're gonna dive into the novel itself, and so this is just a, a warning that you know we will be talking about details of the book. So if you haven't read it yet, 
and you want to be surprised, then you should come back to this podcast after you finish reading it, because we will be getting into spoilers. So for the next section, I'm going to read a summary of the novel, Apocryphal of Lies by Kirsten Beyer. The Full Circle Fleet has resumed its unprecedented explorations of the Delta Quadrant and former Borg space. Commander Liam O'Donnell of the USS Demeter makes a promising first contact with the Nehydrant, humanoid aliens that are collectors of history. When an exchange of data is proposed via a formal meeting, the Nehydrin representatives are visibly shaken when Admiral Catherine Jane Way greets them. For almost a century, two local species, the Rilnar and the Zal, have fought for control of the nearby planet Sormana, with both sides claiming it as their ancestral homeworld. For the last several years, the Rilnar have been steadily gaining ground thanks to the tactics of their current commanding officer, a human woman who appears to be none other than Catherine Janeway herself. We'd like to have uh, Bree and then Kimberly just give a summary of their reactions, just an overview of how they felt the book was. Bree, maybe you can start us off. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, two of my on the mountain, like favorite Voyager episodes would be Shattered and Year of Hell. And this storyline hits both of those episodes. Uh, Kirsten Beyer has a really great ability throughout her books to bring in little bits and pieces from past episodes, even little bits and pieces you've never even considered. She's brought them back into these books. And this book in particular, she really focuses on the stuff we enjoy so much of in Shattered and Year of Hell. So for me, I was just completely sucked into this book. I really liked the concept, especially with how they ended up having two Janeways, which of course we all know is extra exciting um, as Voyager fans, for sure. Uh, two Janeways is something that happens more than once. But uh, I just really enjoyed uh, the book and really liked the concept that it was pulling from uh, the Janeway we meet on Shattered and uh, also the aliens we interact with from Year of Hell. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Bree. Uh, Kimberly, maybe you could talk a little bit about uh, your uh, overall reactions. Um, I, I agree with Bree. It jumps off of two really great Voyager episodes and pulls out all of these little details that since I don't have the episodes memorized to the same degree as I did on some TNG ones, I didn't always get all of the references, but having watched the episodes more even since then, I'm like, wow, there are so many details that she pulls from the show and really elaborates on them and draws them out to uh, create a great story. I, I think one of um, Kirsten's great talents as a writer is having a pretty complex plot line going on, multiple plot lines being juggled, a lot of details, a lot of times where the character says, wait a second, uh, what about this? Why wouldn't this have been the case? And I'm like, oh, that objection didn't even occur to me in the story that was just being taught. So you can tell she's thought everything through and plotted it out so carefully. And yet the heart of every story is the characters and everything is about relationships. And I think my favorite thing about not only the two Janeways here is that her relationships with Chakotay and Tuvok really play a strong role. And those are two of the most meaningful relationships that she has. So having those relationships be with our Janeway and also with the Janeway from Denzit from Shattered, that makes a big uh, impact. Uh, from my side, um, I'm also a big fan of Shattered and Year of Hell. Those are also top favorite episodes for me. So, um, so I was very happy uh, when I realized somewhere towards the middle of the book that it, it's essentially a, a continuation of what's happened in in those two episodes. I mean, I enjoyed definitely enjoyed the you know seeing a, the Dendit Janeway and then how she interacted with Admiral Janeway and Tuvok and Chakotay. As well, I think with Tuvok, it was interesting seeing a darker version of him and how he is sort of grappling with the tragedies that affected his life earlier. So that was interesting. And I also found the 
art related to ECHEP. So that kind of started the book, you know, more like the performance evaluation or review. And so I, even though that was like a more like a, a C plot, I found that to be interesting and wondering what, you know, why the commander, um, I think O'Donnell was giving him a hard time. And don't forget, Peter, Harry Kim has a girlfriend. I mean, that's a pretty big deal. We're used to poor Harry Kim constantly. And in this book, Harry Kim has a girlfriend. Yes, yes, with uh, Nancy. So uh, so it was great. It, I did like, I, yeah, I'm also part of the, um, you know, Harry Kim should be at least a lieutenant commander by, you know, by now. So, so like he should not be an ensign, all only an ensign after seven years. So I was very happy. And um, I think it was homecoming when you know, everyone got the promotions and then, um, and now he kind of is the uh, more of a senior officer. And so yes. well, well-deserved. And I hope um, he, you know, continues, uh, continues to grow. And um, I actually wondering if with the current Star Trek, all the different shows, uh, you know, that's out there, if there's at least a, you know, they did it with Tom Paris and they, you know, they, you know, kept, um, Admiral Janeway has her, you know, lead, lead in, in Prodigy. So I'd like to see a, some type of cameo by uh, Lieutenant Commander Kim sometime, maybe in uh, a yes, lower deck episode. Yes, hard agree. Hard like agree. So, yeah. Yeah. So I think it's... Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think, um, was it Boimler who had the case of all the different places? Yeah. Well, he, well, we could, we couldn't see it though. I think he had a case and he was like, um, like going through the plates, but you couldn't see the Absolutely. actual plate because it was like a top view. So, but he was going through he and just, you know, plate. like rattling off the names of the Voyager crew and he pulled out the pen. Such a relatable <laughs> moment for me. Such a relatable oh, moment for his okay. Voyager collection of plates. Oh my gosh. Yeah, so it's, uh, I'm glad, you know, it's a uh, time, time for that. So maybe, who knows, who knows? I think with Lower Decks and how, you know, creative they are in incorporating, you know, past Star Trek that they could easily do, uh, you know, hopefully do that, something like that uh, eventually then. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, so for, um, to continue with the discussion of origin, we'll start off the first two quick topics. We'll just talk really quickly about the cover and then the epigraph, and then we'll dive into the topic. So um, for the cover, I see two Voyagers. Uh, they're with a separated by a, um, like a green line. So I think that's a, I think a reference to shattered um, near of hell when the sort of two images kind of um, dispersed. So that's like a, gives a clue as to, you know, the two Janeways that we see, you know, by, by having that. So that was just my quick, quick impressions of the cover. There. And a fun fact is that the authors for these Star Trek books do not get to pick the covers. Oh, really? They are not part of the process at all. Um, but I remember when I got to speak with her at Star Trek Las Vegas, uh, she spoke about how pleased she was with a few of these covers that came out um, during these different story arcs. And that was kind of fun to see her excited about it, realizing that she doesn't get to select the covers because this one's a stunning cover. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, that's interesting. I, I didn't know that. The the authors don't get to um, to pick the covers or to have a say in it. So glad, glad that she likes that one. Then, mm-hmm. oh, that's really, thank you, thanks for the uh, the trivia there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like it too. It kind of rewards uh, looking at it a little bit more closely because at first you just see the two mirror images of the ships, but you look at the details a little bit more and you're like, okay, one planet looks peaceful, one planet looks like you know war torn or, or is like something's wrong with it. One of them is a little bit wavy lines. So you're like, you, we're, we're all pretty familiar with parallel dimensions in Star Trek. So you certainly get that vibe um, from the cover. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's true. Then, so it, uh, it's a good one. It captures the attention. And so, it, you know, it serves its purpose. Then. Mm-hmm. Um, the next uh, section deals with the epi- epigraph. And there's actually two epigraphs um, for the books. I'll just read them quickly. Um, The first, uh, Everything We See is a Perspective, Not the Truth, by Marcus Aurelius. And the second is, The Truth Will Set You Free, But First It Will Make You Miserable. Um, Any uh, just quick reactions, um, Kimberly, to either of them? I think before I read the book, I had a little bit of a reaction against the Marcus Aurelius quote saying everything we see as a perspective and not the truth. I wasn't sure if it was setting up the notion that there can't be a truth and and so a, a relativistic 
perspective or view that the, everything is only in the eye of the beholder. Cause I, I don't think I believe that, mm-hmm. but it is a reminder to question what you believe to make sure that you are seeing it from all angles and trying to search for the truth. I mean, because the truth, I believe, you know, a lot of times the truth does exist, but in this book, it's a really great reminder of the, or illustration of this idea that everybody who thinks very strongly that they know what the truth is in their given situation sometimes has that, uh, they have that view upended by getting new information and have to process that. And Mm -hmm. it is a shattering realization in some cases. And so you're like, okay, it absolutely fits with the book. Uh, Brie, do you have any uh, thoughts about either of those? I think Kimberly really covered it. Um, I did have a good chuckle when I read the, the truth will set you free, but first it will make you miserable. (laughs) As we walk through the book, you, you, the ending definitely finishes out with our Janeway being very disappointed in both of her best friends, her space besties, Chakotay and Tuvok. So I feel like uh, this, uh, but first it will make you miserable, uh, really adds to that part of the storyline for sure. I was, remem- I was re- remembering when I was reading the book that the, really for Denza Janeway, is more like the, you know, what she thought was the truth didn't turn out to be the, you know, the truth. So it was just uh, different, you know, facts came in, you know, Dane came into the picture later who provided more information right. and kind of the, explained what happened. And then so Denza Janeway, uh, even the, and I believe even the, you know, her, you know, what she thought was her or, origin story, you know, with uh, being captured by the Zal, by the Zal, you know, that really wasn't the truth. Okay, so then we'll dive into the sort of the themes, the main themes. I think the uh, the, the biggest theme of the the book was really, Den- I think it was Denza Janeway's story, because it's really her, um, you know, her journey from what happened and shattered that the, the, the different uh, journeys that she takes with uh, with Admiral Janeway. I think it was with Tom Paris and then Chakotay and then Janeway and, and then continuing on with Dane and sort of the whole. So I think it was her, uh, her journey, uh, which was this, uh, the story. So I'm going to just read really quickly a, a passage in which Admiral Janeway first saw Denzel Janeway's image. Uh, and maybe that could sort of kick off a, a discussion. Um, her face, the Admiral's first thought was that this must be an unsettling coincidence. In a galaxy populated by countless beings, it was reasonable that several might share many physical characteristics. As she instinctively stepped forward to examine the the display more carefully, her stomach turned and her heart began to run a a thready, uneven race. This was more than resemblance. This was duplication. The woman before her, whoever she might be, was identical in almost every perceptible way to Catherine Janeway. Um, so maybe, Bri, maybe you could talk a little bit about uh, sort of Denza Janeway and her journey and sort of what you thought about that um, major arc for the book. Yeah, I really enjoyed um, that at first everyone was in agreement that Janeway should not meet Janeway, like that she needed to step back and not be part of the conversation directed towards uh, Denza Janeway. And I thought that was really interesting because these are these are staff and friends that know her so well that they knew they needed to try to handle it without her present. And I thought that was really kind of fascinating um, that they went that route, knowing how our Janeway would be reactionary towards it. Um, Especially when Denza Janeway did not, did not follow a path that our Admiral Janeway would have ever fallen. It, It like, she was, uh, like physically upset about hearing that Denza Janeway had no intention of returning back to the Federation. Um, she wanted to stay where she was at because she was here for this war and she was dealing with these people. And of course, 
the hidden fact that she has a lover and family that she needs to stay present for. And it was interesting and kind of fun to see Admiral Janeway being so reactionary and being so like, that's not that's not what I would have done. And I found that to be kind of fun. Um, I could picture Kate Mulgrew interacting and saying all of these things to her, her staff. I thought it was just great. I thought so too. It's so neat how, how she's so certain of herself, even after everything that she's been through with, you know, the death and the resurrection with the Q she still has that certainty of, I wouldn't do things this way, or I can't understand right. why why I myself would have want to stay on Sormana. She doesn't have the ability to empathize with a different version of herself, but that kind of makes sense, right? Like it, it's very unsettling to meet another version of yourself that would be so different because it probably calls into question you know, who she thinks she is. Yes. Especially when she was certain that she was the only one. And it was interesting because we met another Janeway in Endgame, the very mm-hmm. last episode of Voyager. And right. she was she was turned off by that Admiral Janeway too. She was like, I would never do something like this. And so it's fascinating to see her be so dedicated to what she believes she stands for. And she's meeting these other Janeways that are getting caught in these different time frames. And and she really is taken back by that. Um and so Chakotay and Tuvok are right. Yes. Yes. I they know her best. And I think she accepts that at the end too, right? She kind of has to take a step back and say, okay, if the two people that I care about the most and consider my closest friends think this about me, I need to kind of reckon with what that means and trust their judgment, maybe a step back from myself a little bit and and think about that some more because she's the one in charge. She is an admiral. She could overrule both of them, but she has to have enough humility to listen to them. (laughs) I was just going to share, you You had asked earlier what we thought of the Denzit Janeway arc also, and I think we were focusing a little more on Admiral Janeway. Yeah. Um, I just want to say my heart broke for her, oh, the whole I story. I was hard to imagine this this Janeway from Shattered just at the beginning of her career getting yanked out and, and everything that happens to her. And then she thought she was making a, doing something positive with her life, like when she was rescued, like, I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to end this conflict and we'll finally live in peace. And she found her husband and she found purpose and meaning. And it was all built on a lie after everything that she had gone through. I I could understand how broken she felt at the end. Like, okay, I'm rescued. There's peace talks going on. And where do I go? Like she has nothing left. And so my heart broke for her. And I was so happy with the ending that she was able to live out her life in peace with her daughter. It was a beautiful ending. It really was because my heart just so broke for her, especially knowing that they had hidden information from her and that she went forward thinking she was doing the right thing. And it just broke my heart. You, You really summarized it well. Yeah, no, I, I mean, you know, I also agree with with both of you. I think the, um, I didn't really, at the beginning, I didn't know uh, sort of Denzit's Janeway's, um, you know, um, history and background. So I just wasn't, you know, I just saw her really as a, as a war leader. Um, but I think the, as we proceeded further into the book and learn more of the story and learn how much that she uh, like you said, you know, a lot, how much of her background wasn't true and then how, um, you know, sort of other people kind of lied to her and, and, and she ended up, you know, playing a role that other people wanted her to play that, you know, her story, um, you know, became more of a tragic. And I think that was one of the questions I, when I was, you know, writing up the questions, I said, is she a tragic character? Cause I, at least I thought that she was, uh, um, um, that, that she was. So I was also happy at the end that she was able to, um, you know, sort of find, you know, being a, a mother, a parent, finding, because I think the kind of like the last third or quarter of the book was focusing on her, um, uh, you know, journey on trying to uh, find, find her, you know, her daughter again. And, and so they were able to reunite at the end. So I think, you know, very happy. Um, 
to 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 you know have that uh, sort of conclude her arc. I don't know if they follow up with that character. I don't. I think there's only two books left in the full circle cycle. So I don't know if they do that. Oh, that's pretty much the end of her story. I, I don't believe they do. Yeah, I, I don't think they do. I think it's uh, yep. that that timeline is severed from the rest of the multiverse. Oh, yeah, and that's right. We have the, yeah. the time loop because we know oh, that yes. the daughter, Molly, will meet Admiral Janeway 100 years later. So I think we are meant to think that she just quietly lives out the rest of her life. And it seems very healing, mm-hmm. too. Mm-hmm, yeah. And can we can we uh, get a good chuckle at the fact that the daughter ended up being named Mala or Molly, I like loved Molly, that. Like, just like her, <laughs> like her Irish, uh, what, her Irish setter like was named Molly. Was my sister. I just think that's Phoebe so was funny. the mm-hmm. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, so I think. Uh, they made a mistake or something when she was trying yeah, he's, to. He screwed up on a lot. number of levels, um, and uh, right. this is just one of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But actually, yeah. Let's talk about Dane. I mean, he, you know, he came in like half, you know, somewhere in the middle. He wasn't in the beginning of the story, but then he played a, um, you know, a, a pretty big role towards the last half. I mean, I saw him as a villain, or at least villainess. Maybe he had his reasons, but I, I just didn't, didn't. I felt that was his character. Even though at the end, he redeemed a little bit. He reunited Denza Janeway with Mala, and then, but then I think he stepped away, you know, you know uh, and uh, can sort of be together. So, I mean, what were your thoughts about that character, about Dane? Bree? Yeah. Yeah, I I think he really did love her, but he had been living, uh, you know, so many lies and lying to her and giving her motivation. And she was basing her decisions on this information that, you know, he created the kind of this universe around her to make these decisions. And they weren't based on truth. Uh, The whole relationship wasn't based on truth. So my heart breaks for her. I was really disappointed in him. I felt that uh, Bayer does a really good job of introducing him, kind of explaining his motives. You like him at some points, you don't like him at others, and you're frustrated with him, and you're you're really disappointed because Denzit Janeway was basing her decisions off of meeting him and having her life with him. Like, it was just... It was a tough, it was a tough read because of course you want Janeway to like any Janeway in any timeline to have a good life and a good experience. And, uh, you know, he was part of creating Mm -hmm. some of her happier moments and Mm -hmm. some of her real sad moments. Did you have the impression, and maybe this was said specifically, but I wasn't quite clear on it, that he, he did kind of fall in love with her, but he really only expected to stay with her until she died because the Krenim expected her to die at a certain point in time. So he thought that he'd be home free after that. And then it just threw off the plans when she was brought back to life. Yeah. I, that's a really good point. I, I mean, did I think he loved, like, I, I think he loved her, but you're right. I think he thought that uh, the plan was going to go as the plan and it didn't. And that really threw things into peril. I really liked uh, Cambridge's approach to him. And I've, I've heard Kirsten Breyer say that uh, she has Hugh Laurie in mind as the actor. Who oh, I love it. And it's <laughs> so perfect. That little abrasive off you know, kilter. He's a provocative character, but actually really good at his job. Um, and I really liked that he saw through Dane right away because I can be a little more gullible. And so as he's giving the whole explanation of what happened and why, you know, cause he was being so friendly at first when they met him, when they approached the Krenum that you're like, huh, that sounds plausible. And Cambridge is just like, yeah, you're lying. Let's uh, actually get to the real truth of what's happening here. And don't try to say it's all because you loved her. And I'm like, Oh yeah, actually good. Good call. Yep. Yep. I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about the ending. We kind of touched upon it a little bit with Q because I was I was surprised that um, that he showed up at the end and that it sounded like 
um, we were talking a little bit about you know Mala and uh, Denzel at the Denzel Janeway at the end. So it turns out Q and and uh, Q's wife was involved in tying up Denzel Janeway's um, I guess universe and separating it from everything else and kind of having having her um, you know live a, a good life at the end. So it was interesting that they brought Q back and Q's wife back, which I think we saw in. It was in one of the Voyager episodes um, when she was Susie Plaxon, I think, who played her. So, oh man, yeah. she was fantastic as as Lady Q. So, so I know that you know, I know Q is kind of an important character over the years. So it was, and I know you know Q and Jane and and Captain Janeway had a history in in uh, in Voyager. So it was nice that they brought him back to um, to help her. And I think at the end, um, she he would. This was a quote that. Q had at the end. Uh, countless Catherine Janeways have inhabited the multiverse, and only one chose to create a child. I couldn't let her die any more than our son could allow his godmother to die. Um, and then Q's wife said, "Did you just sever this timeline from the rest of the multiverse for the rest of Catherine's life?" Uh, yes, I did. So that's kind of how it ended. Then mm-hmm. there's the. The role that we leave um, Q in at the end of the Eternal Tide is is him being in- furious with Janeway because oh, really? oh. Jun- because Junior does he sacrifice himself or he, he has to die in order for the Omega threat to be defeated and and that was like scary Q which Q I think is at his best when he has that edge and being a little mm. bit dangerous mm-hmm. and frightening and i he was really really upset with janeway and i I liked that that thread was pulled back out here and that he was able to i mean he couldn't stay angry forever because he is omnipotent and probably immortal Uh, but the fact that he found some measure of forgiveness and they did that by helping this other janeway was was pretty meaningful especially in the context of the story where we have Tuvok having lost his son mm-hmm. being a big part of the story um yeah it, it, but but I really was struck by the the notion of okay we already have Jane Emerald Janeway being a singularity of all the multiverses she's she's unique and then only one had a child that was also really fascinating to me um I mean, you don't have to have children, uh, but it seemed just really surprising that of all the Janeways out there, none of them would have had a child. And so it was very meaningful that um, the, that the Denzit was able to live and be a mother for Mala. Yeah, I thought the mentioning, uh, mentioning that this is the only Janeway that ever had a child. I thought that was really fascinating because in some of these books, especially when um, the relationship between Chakotay and Janeway becomes more and more public, a lot of them are inter- like a lot of their friends and coworkers are interested in if they will have a family. And it does get brought up a few times. And Janeway most of the time kind of, you know, says, I enjoy being anti- Catherine to, you know, Michael and Moral. And I, you know, I don't think it's in the cards for me, but she keeps it pretty close to her chest. So I found it fascinating that this got brought up kind of near the end of the book, because I didn't know if that meant that they were really kind of closing out this chapter of what to expect with our Admiral Janeway that we're going to continue on with these books. But uh, I thought it was an interesting topic and something that, you know, of course, this is how many years into the future, 300 so years into the future, like a woman of her age probably could have a child. And there's probably multiple ways of her having a child if she wanted one. Um, So I just thought that was kind of an interesting thing to bring up. I did too. It made me wonder if there was something about who Janeway became as we saw her all the way through Voyager and her life experiences that made her decide subconsciously or or consciously, as you said, she just preferred being an aunt, um, made that decision that that wasn't going to be her role in life. And only somebody that had gone, uh, only a version of her that had gone through what the Denzit went through 
could have gotten to that point in her life, maybe where she accepted that and, and wanted that role for herself. That was an interesting idea. Because I think, I think when she gets the Dear John letter from Mark mm-hmm. in the series, she mentions, you know, well, I we would have been married by now. We'd have probably had children. You know, like, I think she thinks that all through. And that was a path that she was going to take at some point before they got pulled into the Delta Quadrant. And so, but after that experience. Right. No. Yeah. Yeah. No, I found that very yeah. interesting. Yeah. But it was, yeah, but I was happy that between, I mean, comparing Captain Janeway all the way in, you know, caretaker at the beginning and seeing her journey and hearing about what happened to Mark and then meeting Denza Janeway and then Denza Janeway having a child, seeing that whole, you know, character go through was interesting. So he ended up having a happy ending for them. Yeah. Right, right. And, and we have to remember that being captain, she was extremely maternal, uh, especially on the series. We saw her leading these 140 some people on a ship and, Mm -hmm. you know, she was mentoring a lot of people, including Mm -hmm. seven of nine. And uh, so she probably felt very maternal over these people. Um, Probably too much so with Harry Kim because clearly (laughs) she never promoted him. But but, uh, she had a very maternal-like figure, even though she was a figure of authority. Yeah, Yeah, there was one, uh, there was one episode, was one of my, like it's called, I think it was called, uh, it was the one, it was like the Lower Decks version. Well, the Lower Decks, the TNG Lower Decks of Voyager. Good Shepherd. um, Good Shepherd. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Good Shepherd. When she was um, yes. kind of like a maternal, you know, a mom helping the four, uh, three or four, you know, uh, junior officers um, with, with, you know, their work. So it, it was like another example of, of her mater- you know, maternal instincts. Um, and like you said, with, with Seven and with, uh, with Naomi and with Icheb and, you know, folks uh, like that, that she's met along the way. So that was good. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, let's talk a little bit about a uh, couple of the other um, arcs that was part of the book. Uh, one was uh, with uh, Tuvok, because I found it was interesting, sort of a darker and more troubled version of him that we see here compared to you know what we saw in the TV show. I know in um, it was in, in Destiny when he lost his, his uh, yeah. son and daughter-in-law. So I think that kind of colored his... Um, he seemed more angry, I think, uh, in this in this novel than, than in past ones that have before. So maybe just, we could just spend a little bit of time talking about, uh, about his, his arc here. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe, uh, Kimberly, if you have any, any initial thoughts about, uh, about that one. I, um, always liked Tuvok's role as a father on the show, even though we never met his children. I thought he had some really great parental advice to share um, and clearly cared about his children. You know, he's a Vulcan and not supposed to show the emotions. I, his family was clearly important to him, and I liked that part of his character. Um, so I was not surprised that we would see his son's death affect him a lot, but it really was, it was uh, the depth of that was surprising. And the fact that all of his crew mem- crewmates were so happy to see him when they brought him back to the Delta Quadrant and he was still pretty much cut off. It was really, um, you know, tough to see because they're like, they're, they're his friends and he's not capable of accepting their friendship at that point in time. Um, so that was, it, it was a challenging arc for him to go through, uh, but really well done. And I'm glad that I'm glad they had him do that in this book and with these friends because I don't think it really would have fit in the Titan story just because Mm -hmm. yes, he's in the Titan books, but this is, this is Voyager. So these are, there is from his family. Yeah. 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 It actually reminded me when I was reading that scene, um, of, of actually the, um, Spock from Star Trek, the motion picture when Spock first entered the, um, bridge of the enterprise, when uh, uh, after he left the Colonar on Vulcan, so he was more like serious and you know less more logical, more Vulcan. And then I remember it was like McCoy and Uhura and, and right. Kirk was trying to you know kind of thought it was sort of the TOS days, but he was very serious and he kind of just didn't you know 
wasn't very personable. So wrote, that that first scene, that Tuvok when he arrived on the transport, you know, in the transport room, reminded me a little of that one from uh, from the motion picture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so similar. Di I mean, different reasons, you know, different uh, causes, but you know, similar effects there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I thought just as another like praise for Kirsten Byers' writing, she has his voice down pat. Um, Every interaction is dry humor, like amusement, intensity. I'm just like, this is just perfect Tuvok. Well, and we always have to remember that Vulcans actually feel emotion very strongly. So, of course, they would be trying to attempt to hide that and stay very stoic. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think um, I kind of in general, you know, I do enjoy reading Kirsten, but I really haven't read a whole lot of her uh, novels yet. But the, you know, but this may be like the first or mm -hmm. second one um, that I've read. But I do enjoy the she does capture the Voyager voices uh, very well, so it's good that yeah. Um, okay, um, Bri, I don't know if you had any uh, thoughts about the Tuvok arc. Yeah, I did. So at the very ending of the book, when she's wrapping everything up, I really enjoyed the conversation that Tuvok had with Admiral Janeway. And Tuvok, you know, made it very clear to the Admiral that he had counseled Captain oh, Chicote oh. to withhold the information about Denzit Janeway's child. And, uh, you know, he stated why he thought they should withhold that information. And, uh, I just thought that conversation was really a solid one. I could picture it happening um, just because they developed such a friendship over the you know series. We got to see how they interacted with each other. And I really liked that Tuvok, and you have to think of this, like during the series, Tuvok and Chakotay were not best buds. So it's funny because they both love the same woman. And of course they have to get along. And um, Tuvok really does try to make it very clear that she should, you know, forgive Chakotay because everything that Chakotay did was based upon his, you know, Tuvok's counsel. Mm -hmm. And I really thought that was so sweet of Tuvok because of course, Captain Chakotay and Admiral Janeway are in a relationship together, like a physical, emotional so relationship. Yeah. So he was trying to do his job of like, trying to walk Chakotay into <laughs> maybe out of the doghouse a little bit, um, which I thought was really sweet of him. Mm. And uh, it's so considerate. And here I'll read a really quick, I highlighted this um, after Tuvok asked for his forgiveness and asked for her to forgive Chakotay. Janeway, Janeway stated, Captain Chakotay is in a difficult position. His primary concern is the safety of his crew, as it should be. When the conflicts with his sense of obligation to you, and then uh, uh, Janeway raised her hand to silence him. Chakotay, Chakotay and I are struggling to find an appropriate balance between our duties and our personal relationship. We are a work in progress. And uh, he goes, permit me to wish you success in finding that balance. Despite these setbacks, <laughs> the choice you have made seems to agree with you both. And she agrees that it does. And I just thought that was so sweet because he goes on to talk about how he's been married for a gajillion decades. And I just thought that was a really sweet conversation and something that I really think uh, the Tuvok, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. he counsels her as a good friend. And uh, I just thought that was a really beautiful segment. Um, and I'm glad that they closed the book out with that. Mm -hmm. I really thought it was nice. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. It actually, I'm reading that section. It reminded me of a couple of my favorite Tuvok Janeway scenes in the show. Um, the birthday cake, there was like that birthday cake <laughs> one <laughs> when Janeway kind of surprised Tuvok uh, with the birthday cake and they were, they were kind of like teasing each other a little bit with, you know, you know, with, with the whole thing. And then um, a little bit on the sadder note at, um, at Endgame, Endgame, the future part of Endgame, when uh, Janeway went to visit Tuvok while he was, um, I guess, in the hospital or, or, you know, and having the health problems. But oh, that was so heartbreaking. They were, yeah, that was like, but their friendship, you know, it was even though he didn't really um, remember much of it, but he kind of knew enough. But then Admiral Janeway, you know, knew more about it. But that was a, a really good scene uh, played mm -hmm. out by both. Both. So it kind of so that ending scene that you just uh, read reminded me of the uh, you know the friendship and the you know counsel that Tuvok and Janeway 
um, you know, uh, provide for each other. Right. Okay. Uh, then the next, uh, there was a couple of other arcs. Maybe we we'll talk of, for a little bit about about Harry Kim and Nancy Conlon because they had Nancy was trying to like help improve the sh- the shields. I think of to try to protect Voyager. Harry Kim was helping her, but it was a you know a smaller arc between the two of them because they were trying to, you know starting a relationship together and they were you know getting used to that as well. Kimberly, do you have any uh, thoughts on that one? Yeah, I was, um, I'm very happy to see Harry in a relationship and not so happy to see how incredibly fraught it is uh, for good reason. Um, but it, but it's tough to read. I, I didn't realize actually until later, um, I didn't know Nancy Collin was a create, a character from the prior set of books. Is it the Corps of Engineers, the Starfleet Corps of Engineers books? So I don't I don't think she was an original character, but they brought her on to here. So I didn't have any background of what happened on her prior um, ship. I, I know that her arc in this story is supposed to show uh, a journey through depression. And it's so personally drawn and with so, so many details from Nancy's perspective and then also from the people around her who care about her. It's tough to read, and I do. I struggled uh, with a lot of the conversations and the way that she was thinking because she just has so much despair and hopelessness in the way that she's thinking. And I, I like that they they had Belana reach out to her and try and share what her background had been after she learned about the Maquis and was the um, and and went through some self destructive activities before she worked her way through that and it and Harry tries to help her and and be the stronger one and say like hey you don't get to make the decision for me whether I want to be with you or not like I love you and I want to be with you and she's just pushing everybody away mm-hmm. so that that was a tough story yeah yeah, yeah I think I agree I, I I like you know it was good giving. Um, you know, ha- having Harry sh- show her s- show support yeah. to her, uh, but it was also hard seeing her, you know, being desperate and being sad on 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 different fronts, whether it's work or whether it's in her you know personal life or whether um, the the health problem that she was having, which I think was from an earlier book. Um, so it was just very you know, sort of a, at least right now a, a sad time for her. Then, hmm? yeah, she's not in for an easy story arc for character in the upcoming books uh nor is harry which is unfortunate um oh my goodness i know i know and and that's why at the very beginning of the podcast i was like harry has a girlfriend because i'm really happy for him you can tell that he cares for her deeply and he's being such an outstanding guy but man it it really is painful Mm. uh to read and my heart just goes out to both of them but especially her Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, I guess when we, I, th- I think there's about two more books after this one. Um, so we may be covering those in a future uh, Trek book club uh, down the road. So maybe we could find out. I sure hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I, I believe there's actually one um, so one request uh, to, to, to at least, you know, uh, read the next one. So I, I put that, I'm, I'll probably will put that on the poll sometime in the near future. Kim, Kimberly and I will start a uh, Twitter campaign. We'll make it happen. <laughs> uh-huh, yeah, sure, sure. No problem. It's, uh, you know, it's uh, trying to, you know, drum up support. Uh, for. Just, for, I know, just for have choices. to say one more time that The Eternal um, Tide is like one of my top two Star Trek novels ever. And Peter, <laughs> if you haven't had a chance to read, I, I would recommend going back to read that one. Because it's, it's outstanding. Mm, okay, sure. Mm-hmm. Mm, okay. Good. Is is it a is it part of the full circle or is it like a standalone? The eternal. Yes, Pride? it's part of the full circle, and it's how Janeway how comes it? back. Ah, okay. It's, it's okay, a, cool. It's a, All right, sounds good. Okay. Yeah. yeah, no, she does an outstanding job of bringing bringing her back from death because, of course, Captain Janeway was killed, or Admiral Janeway uh, was killed in the TNG novels. So. Mm-hmm. It was dicey how she was going to be able to come back, and I thought that uh, Kirsten Bear did really good. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bayer did a really good job. It's it's an epic story. It's like it's like a Destiny level story, but it's just with Voyager. But it's and, and the Q, right? So mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Great. Okay. 
yeah, that uh, that's how I'll keep that in uh, keep that in mind. Because I remember hearing when I was diving into Trek books recently, I was hearing, oh, you know, Admiral Janeway does die somewhere in the novels, but then she comes back, and I kind of said, like, oh, I wonder how that happened. Right. You know, I mean, it's you know, this happens all the time. But I said, I wonder how that happened. It's <laughs> you know, a good so story. Just, yeah, I'll find that. Okay, I'll keep that in mind. And maybe who knows? Maybe one day the Eternal Tide will, you know. Will be and of course, else, Kimberly but, uh, was very lucky because she didn't have to wait for the book to drop. She found the books and was able to gobble them up back to back to back, which I'm kind of jealous of because I appreciate uh, how, how lucky yes. I was in that regard. <laughs> I've been in the waiting and waiting for the next book thing, but but it wasn't in this case. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the that's the um, sort of the novel equivalent of watching Best of yeah. Both Worlds Part One. It, right. back in the oh. early 90s waiting three months summer over the of summer one man that was that was tough <laughs> i do remember that yeah right i remember that i was like what you know like five minutes before the end of part one it suddenly <laughs> hit me I, said, I wonder if they're gonna do a cliffhanger like, they don't have enough time to resolve what's gonna happen with the borg and picard and so and then to hear that uh, to hear those i remember because like those op those those um to be continued <laughs> notes you know those musical notes <laughs> when uh shelby was you know looking at Riker, and then Riker was saying fire it's like yes. more fire or oh. something like that and then it that summer was painful. <laughs> yeah, that it was. And back then it wasn't like we didn't have Twitter right. or the internet. So I had nobody to talk to, you know, like I, I didn't really know too many people who are Trek fans in real life. So I was like, it was just me trying to wondering what's going to happen. And, you know, I had sent my self-addressed stamped envelopes and this definitely is aging me by sent my self-addressed stamped envelopes off to all of the convention companies at the time. And uh, I then at every family meeting mentioned what upcoming conventions were taking wow. place that summer because I felt like I might be able to get wow. some information because I was really worried, like, is Patrick Stewart not coming back to the show? Is that really true? I was a very stressed <laughs> 10 or 11 year old. I, I was a serious kid. Let's just put it that way. And that made for a very serious summer. Yeah. I was very Yeah, because I think there were reports of Patrick Stewart like may not be, it might've been a contract Oh, the contract was, you know, maybe after three years and then, you know, they would have to renew or something like that. But there were some rumors that he may not be. And so that was like, that would be a big deal if, if it would have come to come to pass. I don't know how we ended up <laughs> there. But, oh yeah. Because of the clip. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Kimberly yeah. <laughs> got to gobble these books up and I'm, I'm a little bit jealous about that because I found the books late, but I didn't find them that late. And I just remember thinking, how in the world is she going to bring back Janeway? And uh, that book is excellent. Mm -hmm. Highly mm -hmm. recommend. Okay, great. Okay, I'll uh, definitely keep that in mind then. Yeah, a lot of books to read, a lot of books to read. Okay, and then the last arc that I've, maybe we just talked briefly is Icheb's arc because Icheb, and it started the book off in which he was doing a performance, I guess, maybe a performance observation or evaluation uh, on uh, Lieutenant Elkins, one of the chief engineers, but then he kind of, the Commander O'Donnell, who was the, the captain, you know, kept on saying no to each of them and just say, try again, try again. So, and then at the end, Lieutenant Bryce uh, explained to each of what was the reasoning behind the cap, the commander's uh, actions. So just, you know, mm -hmm. uh, maybe Bree could talk a little bit about uh, what you thought about that, uh, the final uh, arc there. Hmm. Something that I really enjoy about the books is that each ship really gets uh, thought out and his character really gets developed. I really enjoy his interactions and relationship that he has with Bryce. I think it's really an interesting one. And you can see each of growing and learning every time he's interacting with not only the crew, but especially Bryce. I thought that was really great. Yeah, yeah. I, I like that ending scene with uh, when Bryce was explaining everything to each app. So yes. I, I, I didn't really know much about uh, Bryce before this novel. So it was nice to see him sort of being like a mentor to each app. So that was good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, nice to see that develop over time. I, I was also, I thought it, Kirsten does a good job of doing some of the workplace dynamic stories mm -hmm. too. And it, I thought it was a little bit unfair that nobody explained to each of why he couldn't do what he was doing and just kept trying to make him figure it out for himself. But I guess that's one method of management and teaching. 
It's all by doing or something like that. Yeah, yeah, but asking somebody to figure out these types of interpersonal dynamics or you know, things that are like way above his age and experience is like, that's a little harsh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Can you imagine working on a starship and like dealing with so many different cultural and types of, of, uh, co-workers I, can, no, I can't it takes imagine. some skill for sure and you can see that on the management and but, but you do yeah. know that O'Donnell is is an interesting like offbeat character and so or it's you can see why there might be a unique situation there but yeah I, I, mm-hmm. I felt a little bad for each of to mm-hmm. just be yeah. getting kicked back and figure it out on your own I'm like mm-hmm. thanks just <laughs> give, give him a hint here <laughs> yeah yeah, I guess it might be like um, like representative and maybe in some, you know, current workplaces, sometimes that happens in which uh, someone gets stuck and still gets stuck. So um, probably not ideal, but I guess that happens once in a while. Then. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, we're going to wrap up uh, and see if, uh, were there any sort of final comments related to the novel that you wanted to uh, share? You know, any final conclusions or reactions uh, to the story? Um, Bree? Yeah, so I really thoroughly enjoyed this book and um, my excitement about it probably comes through pretty hard, uh, but Shattered and Urfell are two of my favorites uh, in in the episodes of Voyager. So I f- fully read this fully enjoyed it and uh it really leaves you at a point where you really wonder if Janeway is going to forgive Chakotay fully and I find that so so I I love angst I guess that's what it comes down to is I love the angst of it and of course I'm a big Janeway Chakotay shipper not that I thought they should be together while they were on the ship in the Delta Quadrant but I felt like when they got home, they should at least have a relationship. And so it's painful to see in these books where you can see that they've, they're working through these hardships and it's not all, you know, peace roses and happiness and bathtubs. Um, it's, it's uh, more, they're working at it and they're trying to figure out how to, how to get together and be together. And uh, I just really enjoy that. Um, I like the big arcs of the characters that, uh, Kirsten Beyer presents. I think she does an outstanding job of lyrically including so many other points of Star Trek. Uh, I can see why she's used on Star Trek Discovery and all the other newer tracks as kind of a historian because she really does have a grasp of the Star Trek universe as a whole. But she really covers these voices of the characters so well. And I just, I burned through this book on the first read very quickly and have read it over a couple of times uh, since it's been out. And uh, it's one that I highly recommend if you haven't had a chance to read it yet. Mm, Okay, great. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you, Bree. Um, And Kimberly, do you have any uh, closing thoughts on Apocrypha Full of Lies? Uh, Those are great thoughts. I uh, agree. I I think this is a book that uh, stays good on rereading. This was my third time reading it through. Um, Mm -hmm getting ready for the podcast. And the story is so well done that even when you've read it before, it, it still unfolds in a way that the revelations still come and you're still a little bit surprised by them every time. And, and going through the emotions each time is, is neat. When you can do that, it, it, it's like watching a really good episode. You can watch it and know exactly what's coming and still have a moment of surprise or still experience the emotions that you did the first time through. And I think that's a mark of great writing when you can revisit a book that way. I also um, really appreciate the time travel and the chronoton torpedoes and the temporally shielded buoys and the chronoton pools. It, it, it does make you think it's, it's a good mix of things, kind of like David Max writing. Kristen Beyer is really good about doing the relationships, having the overall themes of hope and peace and looking for the best in others, challenging your own way of thinking, moving beyond uh, what you base emotions, like trying to be better than who you are and, and putting that all into a very complexly plotted story uh, that, is is intricately done and entertaining to read so i 
really highly recommend this book also. Of course, people who are listening to this have probably read it, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Especially if they made it this far. <laughs> read it again. Yeah, it's great. And so thank you for um, having me on to talk about it because it's a lot of fun to discuss. Oh, sure. Of course. No, thank you for coming. Relatively you know, newer to the Full Circle arc, but I also enjoyed reading it. It was between the Denza Janeway, and I'm also a big fan of Shattered and Year of Hell. So having it follow those two excellent episodes was, you know, an additional plus. So I enjoyed reading um, Denza Janeway and how Admiral Janeway, you know, works through um, the whole story, um, to the Tuvok arc. I was, I didn't really know, you know, that was where Tuvok was left off uh, at at the beginning of this novel. So uh, seeing him uh, was uh, was very good, um, as well as Chakotay, uh, and you know Harry Kim and Nancy Collin, the the Egypt and the with arc with Lieutenant Elkins, you know, very sort of a workplace area. I'm actually I, I'm in the human resources. So that's my. My my day job is in human resources, so so that's a little that little arc I could relate to it or at least stand this as I deal with that at work. So that was interesting. Did you approve? Did you approve? Hmm? Oh. <laughs> no, I think I I could relate to him. I kind of felt like <laughs> like you've mentioned before. I felt bad that he didn't really have some of the support uh, from the from the rest of the crew, uh, especially since he was you know. But I guess every ship handles things a little differently. Um, <laughs> um, but that was interesting. So I think overall, I, you know, I enjoyed it as well, and um, and I'm, you know, glad that that Denza Janeway, you know, had a had that happy ending that to to wrap up her uh, story there. Mm-hmm. Okay. What's the best way to contact you, Bree and Kimberly? And if you if there's any projects or anything you want to share with our listeners, um, you could uh, feel free to uh, let us know. Yeah, sure. So I am on Twitter and my handle is Bree, B-R-E-E, Elizabeth, uh, all one word. And I talk about Star Trek. I share photos of my cats and uh, I am a friend of DeSoto, which means I interact with the greatest generation and the greatest Trek quite a bit. So I always have fun talking about Star Trek. So definitely feel free to engage with me there. Love to hear your thoughts on this book. Okay, well, thank you, Bree. Uh, thank you very much for joining us on on this podcast. Okay, Kimberly, maybe you could share your contact where we can reach you. Sure, I am also on Twitter. My handle is at CallieND3, so K-A-L-L-I-E-N-D-3. Uh, and that's the easiest place to find me. I generally post about Star Trek, Star Wars, and occasional pictures of my baby. And uh on Facebook, I am also a friend of DeSoto, probably not as closely connected as Bree, but I'm on the Greatest Trek and Greatest Generation um, Facebook groups as well. I like to participate on there. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, Kimberly. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having us. I'm so happy to be able to talk about the book with you. Okay, great. All right, thank you. And for me, my name is Peter Hong. I can be found on Twitter. It's at Peter Trek One, the number one. Most of my tweets are related to Star Trek, with a few on related to James Bond, uh, science fiction, and soccer. There's also the Trek Book Club, which you probably know. It's at Trek Book Club, where we read and discuss Star Trek books approximately every six weeks. And you can find us at, at Trek Book Club, where we'll post what the next book we, we will be reading is. Thank Bree. Uh, Thank you, Kimberly. Uh, We hope you had a good time and we hope for our listeners that you enjoyed this podcast. Uh, This is our first episode uh, of the revival of this podcast. So please let us know what your feedback is, what your thoughts are. And if it's successful and of interest, we'll be having more of these podcasts of our upcoming book discussions. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good day. Bye-bye.